Well, good morning, everyone. Come on in and find your seat. We're so glad that you could gather with us uh, this morning. I've already seen uh, a lot of our college students' faces this morning. They must be back from uh, break, Thanksgiving break this week. We're so glad that everybody is here and can gather with us this morning. If you're a, a guest, we're especially thankful that you chose to worship with us this morning. We hope that you'll find our church is a church that loves our God, exalts our Savior, but also loves one another. So thank you if you're a guest for visiting with us today. If this is your first time, um, I'd love to invite you to scan the QR code on the seat in front of you that says welcome guests. That will allow us to know that you are here worshiping with us, allow us to connect with you, and allow us to share uh, a free coupon for a, a free cup of coffee at Crazy Love Coffee House right here in, uh, in Roswell. And then we'll mention this again at the end of the service, but if you've been visiting Lebanon for a little while um, and you'd like to meet the pastors and you haven't met us yet following the conclusion of our gathering this morning, uh, the pastoral team's going to be meeting over in the coffee area. And if you're visiting today or have been visiting just recently, we'd love to uh, get to know you a little bit better. There's a lot going on at Lebanon, especially as we uh, look towards the Christmas season together. But instead of giving you all the announcements one after another, I'm only going to give you one. And it is this, the weekly update, okay? If you have not signed up yet for the weekly update, it's an email that goes out every Friday afternoon and it includes everything that is going on at Lebanon Baptist Church. If you want to be in, if you want to be in the know, then you're going to want to sign up for the weekly update. So you can take your, some people are already scanning, you can scan that QR code, it'll sign you up for that list, and then every Friday uh, you'll get a report of what's uh, going on at Lebanon. I want to encourage you to do that, especially as uh, we are looking forward to the Christmas season. And uh, one final announcement regarding Christmas and the Operation Christmas Child. Tammy wanted me to just share with you all that we packed and filled 92 boxes for Operation Christmas Child. So thank you for uh, everybody who was a part of that. Each one of those boxes represents um, a gospel tract that is going to a child. So uh, let's pray that God uses that um, outreach in the lives of, of children all over this world. This morning... Uh, is our praise gathering. We usually do a praise gathering the Sunday before Thanksgiving to prepare our hearts um, for this week. And this morning, we've kind of selected a psalm, Psalm 34, as, as sort of um, the guideline for our singing and our praying uh, together. Throughout this morning, I'm going to ask you to join with me in saying Psalm 34, and then we'll sing together. I'll also say there's about nine songs that we got this morning, so normally we do like five. We're, we're doing nine songs. Um, I like it when people stand because I feel like you can kind of sing a little bit more strongly. But do know this, if you do get tired midway through, you can sit down. There will be moments where I'll ask you to sit, but I just want everybody to feel as comfortable as they want to um, as we go throughout this time together. So Psalm 34 is a psalm of David, and it was how the Lord delivered him out of the hand of Abimelech, and, Abimelech, and um, David is recounting God's faithfulness to him in a very scary situation in his life. And he comes to the point where he says, really I think the climax of this, this whole um, chapter is verse eight, oh taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. So I'm gonna pray that God will allow this psalm to seek, sink deeply into our hearts that the songs that we've chosen to sing together will resonate in our souls and that we'll move from simply being grateful for what God's done for us to adoring Him for who He is. He is truly good. Would you pray with me? Father, we come to You this morning, a grateful people. 
but we're grateful not simply for the things that you give us. We're thankful ultimately for who you are. You are a God who has the ability to satisfy the deepest longings of our heart. Lord, things can be taken away from us. Things may never be given to us, but because of your son Jesus and what he represents, Father, we thank you that we have everything our heart needs today to trust you. And so, Lord, we look to you with eyes of worship and adoration. We marvel that you would think about us, that you care about us. And Lord, I pray that you would help us today to trace all of our thoughts back to you, the great giver. And I pray that you would be honored and glorified in all these things. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand now, and we'll begin reading the first three verses together of Psalm 34. Let's start. I will bless Bless the Lord Lord at at all times. times. His His praise praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul makes its boast in the Lord. Let the the humble hear and be glad. O magnify magnify the Lord with me, and and let us exalt his name together. together. Sing together.
to reign. Heaven and earth will join to say. I sought the Lord, and he answered me, and delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant, and their faces shall never be ashamed. This poor man cried, and the Lord heard him and saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Sing together, we will feast in the house of Zion. Restored. 
He has done great things we will say together. We will feast and we no more. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him. I lift my eyes and see, I need not be afraid, all my help comes from the Lord, who the earth and sky has made. Continue working our way through Psalm 34. Let's read together, starting in verse 8. O taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. O fear the Lord, you his saints, for those who fear him have no lack. The young lions suffer and want and hunger. But those, those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. Let's sing together 10,000 Reasons. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul, worship his holy name. Like never before, oh my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning. It's time to sing your song again. What 
And on that day when my strength is failing, the end draws near and my time has come. Still my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years and a faithful God who surrounds those who love him. Aren't you thankful that he is faithful even when we often are not? He never changes. Great is his faithfulness. Great is thy faithfulness, O God my Father.
Father, we thank you that all we need, you have graciously provided to us. You're a God whose resources never run out. You're a God whose strength never runs dry. You're a God who satisfies the longing of our deepest need. And Lord, we pause to thank you for simple things like sustaining our very life. Every breath we breathe, every beat of our heart, Lord, comes from you. And even in the midst of all the joy that you have packed into our lives, Lord, we walk through a a world that is broken. And yet, even in the brokenness, when joy is mixed with sorrow, Lord, we thank you that joy is never truly taken away because you have given us Christ. I thank you that our sins have been pardoned by the blood of the Lamb of God. I thank you that there is no more fear No more fear of wrath or judgment for our sins, for Jesus himself bore our sins on his own body on the cross. He brought us who were guilty and unworthy to you, Father, and dressed us in his righteousness so that we can actually address you as Father and that not be an empty term, but a term full of meaning. For we are your children. And you never forsake us, even in the darkness, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are there beside us, your rod and your staff comfort us. And so, Lord, we thank you that we have tasted and seen that you and your son Jesus are good. And I pray that that truth would help us in the moments we need it most, when we need a light to shine through the darkness of this world. We thank you, Father, and it's in Jesus' name I pray these things. Amen. Continue reading together through Psalm 34. The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous and his ears toward their cry. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the memory of them from the earth. When the righteous cry for help, the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. The Lord is near us when our hearts are broken. of change may rage tomorrow. God is at your side, no longer dread the fires of unexpected sorrow. God, you are my God, and I will trust in you and not be shed. steadfast spirit within me to rest in you alone. Still, my soul be still, do not be moved by lesser lights and flaming arrows. God, you are my God, and I will trust in you and not be shaken. Lord of peace, renew a steadfast spirit within
truth you learned in the beginning. Wait upon the Lord, and hope will rise as stars appear when day is dim. of Psalm 34. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He keeps all his bones, not one of them is broken. Affliction will slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems the life of his servants. 
none of those who take refuge in him will be condemned. We live in a world that, if you look at it honestly, it's a broken world. But it's not a world beyond God's redemption. In fact, Jesus, by his death on the cross and resurrection, has already begun mending it. But there will be a day when we stand in his presence and there will be no more tears for he himself will wipe away all of our tears. And we will forever be with the Lord. And as we look back on all of our trials and sufferings and then see Jesus seated on the throne, those things will melt away in the light of his glory and majesty because he is worthy. Do you feel the world is broken? We do. Do you feel the shadows deepen? We do. Do you know that all the dark won't stop the light from getting through? We do. Do you wish that you could see it all made?
people of the Lord said? Amen. Amen. At this time, we'd like to dismiss our kids K-4 through the second grade out the back doors. Parents, you can pick them up at the conclusion of our gathering right down this hallway. Thank you very much. He is worthy of all of our praise. We sang nine songs, but in eternity, through eternity, we're going to sing his glorious praise. As you can tell, I have not been able to sing very well today. Uh, I uh, somehow caught something and uh, have had a lot of drainage, so my voice is not all there. But Lord willing, we're going to make it through this morning as we look into God's Word and uh, once again are thankful that God has communicated to us all that He desires us to do in our lives. We have a lot to be thankful for, but the most important thing is Jesus Christ and His work on the cross. And so may we uh, continue to uh, praise Him even as we listen this morning. Let me invite you to turn in your Bibles to Romans 12. Excuse me, Romans 14, okay. Romans 14. Now, those of you who've been through this series, you say, what, you're backing up? No. Romans 14, we're going to read a text there in just a moment. Many of you who have been coming to Lebanon for now a number of months know that we've been making our way through this epistle to the Romans, and you understand that Romans chapters 1 through 11 shared with us all that God has done for us in Christ, how we had a great problem, our problem was sin, but Jesus was the remedy for that, and He ultimately died on a cross so that you and I could have our sins forgiven. Then in Romans chapter 12 that we looked at now a couple of months ago, we began to see our response to God's grace. Grace receivers should now live totally different within our new family, the church. We're part of Lebanon Baptist Church, a local church, one of the one part of God's church that's meeting today all over the world. And we are a melting pot of various people from different cultures, different backgrounds, who've embraced Jesus Christ. Well, beginning in Romans chapter 14, Paul began to talk of how within that melting pot there will be various opinions that come about as you begin to meet together. And sometimes those are differing opinions. As Paul is talking about a church that has various opinions about various things, he labels some of them strong and weak. Strong in faith and weak in faith. And he's probably talking at that point about some Jewish believers and some Gentile believers who differed in reference to practicing certain things. Now, the weak really didn't understand all that their new freedom in Christ entailed. They thought they still had to observe certain days. They couldn't eat certain things. However, the church brought all these people together in Christ. However, they had these differing opinions, and not only did they have these, and that was a problem because it was kind of erupting, it was exasperated by a time of separation. What had happened was Claudius had sent all the Jews out of Rome, and now they had returned. And now they're trying to meld back together. It was almost like COVID. Remember when we were separated for a long time? And some people were masked, some people were no mask, and different strong opinions arose. 
And now you're all back together. And you're having to once again seek unity in Christ. Well, in Romans 14, verses, the first 12 verses, we learned that you and I, when it comes to the people that we go to church with, we got to be people that are continuing to lay out the welcome mat to all the various ones that come to this church. But we also need to put down the gavel. And oftentimes, we can judge not knowing this person's background, and we think, why are they doing things that way? Or why are they eating that? Why are they taking part in that? And we can do a lot of damage to the unity of the church. And Paul tells them at the, really at the last part of the text that we looked at a few weeks ago, is that you and I need to live in light of the true judge. I mean, I should care very little of what you think of me and even what I think about myself because I'm not going to be the judge of myself, and you aren't either. The one who's going to judge me is what? The Lord. And I've got to live all my life for the audience of one. He's the one in charge. Well, in today's text, what happens is this. Paul continues his exhortation, but he begins to focus on a group of people that you would call the strong in faith who knew that they had this new freedom, and one of the areas that they had this freedom was really to eat whatever they wanted. There were some people who thought that they could, couldn't eat certain types of food because of idolatry associated with it or because of the Mosaic law, but there were some who were like, hey, we can eat whatever because Jesus had declared all things clean and they knew of this freedom in Christ to eat, but what Paul does is he warns them about eating to the detriment of the weak, those who didn't think they could do these things. And so listen to me as I read the text, the scripture. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 13 and read through the end of the chapter. It says this, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer but rather decide never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of a brother. I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one for whom Christ died. So do not let what you regard as good be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by man. So then, let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Everything is indeed clean, but it is wrong for anyone to make another stumble by what he eats. It is good not to eat meat or drink wine or do anything that causes your brother to stumble. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. But whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats. Because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. I'll tell you what, we're going to need God's help to understand what this says because God calls us to obey him and to live in light of the gospel. So let's ask God for his help today. Father, I come to you, first of all, I ask that you would help my voice today to be clear but actually, Father, I ask that all of these people would look beyond my voice and hear your voice in the words of these statements. And Lord, help us to be hearers of your word and doers of your word. We pray for that help today in Jesus' name. Amen. No doubt many of you in this room 
have had the wonderful privilege to be a part of helping lead a person to Jesus Christ. And God used you, whether you planted, you sowed, uh, I mean, you, uh, you planted or you watered, you got to see someone accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's a wonderful thing. But I have a question to pose to you this morning. It's an unusual question. But let me ask you this. Could we, as a church or you as an individual, could we assist in leading a person to hell by insisting on eating pepperoni pizza after the church gathering. You're like, what in the world? Could we assist in helping lead a person to hell by insisting that we eat pepperoni pizza after the church gathering? Some of you would say, no way. How could eating pepperoni pizza do anything to hurt another person? I would answer to you to that question, it's plausible. It's possible. You say, now how? Explain yourself, Pastor Brian. Is it a sin to eat pepperoni pizza? No. I mean, I'd be in trouble every Friday night, okay? <laughs> Is it a sin to eat it? So how? Well, our text warns us of causing one to stumble and destroying them by insisting on our menu. I want my menu. I like pepperoni pizza. And many of you know pepperoni pizza has what in it? Pork. And a lot of people are against eating pork. It could cause a problem. And that's why you and I, as we live life, we always need to be cautious. And the lesson we're going to learn is simple as this. Beware, don't prioritize your freedom in Christ over your love for other people. Let me say that again. Beware, don't prioritize your freedom in Christ over your love for others. This morning we're going to look at three things and then we'll be done. We're going to look at the issue, we're going to look at the danger, and then we're going to look at the counsel that is given. First of all, let's look at the issue. What's the issue at hand? Well, in order to see the issue, we need to see the parties involved and kind of the point involved. There were two parties. There was the strong in faith, who I would say was probably a majority of these Gentile believers. And then there was the weak in faith, which were these Jewish believers. Now, all of these people were coming to Jesus Christ, but some of them were coming to Jesus Christ out of very strong religious backgrounds. And some of them had dietary laws that were laid out. However, we all know from text to scripture that Jesus had declared all foods clean. I'm not going to take you to the text. If you want it, talk to me afterwards. We know that he had to teach a lot of people these particular truths. In fact, Remember when he told Peter one day when he had a vision and he dropped all these unclean animals and says, take Peter and eat. And he says, I've never eaten anything unclean. And he has to tell Peter, a Jewish man who was, you could say, lots of faith in his life, but he had to tell him three times, don't call what I have said is clean, unclean. And he had to learn that particular truth. That story is found in Acts chapter 10. Well, in our text, Paul sides with these strong in faith Gentiles by reiterating that all foods are clean. In fact, look what it says in verse 14. It says at the beginning, I know and I am persuaded in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. 
Nothing's unclean. And he says it again, go down to verse 20. Do not, for the sake of food, destroy the work of God. Then he says this, everything is indeed clean. Now, some people weren't too sure about that. They still had some inklings that maybe, I'm not sure if I can be involved in that. How do we know? Look at verse 14 again and look at the end of the verse. It says, I know and am persuaded that nothing is unclean in itself, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. And you say, what? For the person whose conscience, who thinks it's unclean and they take of it, it's unclean to them. Their consciences were bothered. Now, just to kind of get the issue again, some of the meat that they were eating in Rome had been meat that were slaughtered, that was part of, you could say, idolatry in the community. And some people says, I don't want nothing to do with an idolatry, so I'm just going to eat vegetables because I want to please God. Okay. And maybe they were looking at these other people who were eating meat and says, should they be eating that particular food? Should they be involved in that? Well, some of them were saying, yes, Jesus declared all things clean. And some of them were saying, how dare you eat of that stuff? And what was happening was the strong in faith were looking down on the weak and saying, dude, read the Bible. Jesus said all things clean. The pepperoni pizza's fine. Okay, let's just eat. They were looking down, but the weak were saying, look at these people. They're just disregarding God's commands. They're doing wrong. And what was happening, the unity of the church was being compromised. And you know what possibly could happen? Some of those Gentile, I mean, some of those Jewish believers would say, I may just need to go back to the what? I may just need to go back to the synagogue. Because they're all kind of like me. I, yeah, I've heard about Jesus, and I, I think that he's the chosen Messiah, but you know what? Look at all these. Is this really where the faith leads? And they were... They were worried. So what does Paul do? He dives in. He says in verse 13, he says this, Therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another any longer, but rather let us decide never to put a stumbling block or a hindrance in the way of a brother. So what happens here is this. Paul reiterates what he told the weak about Remember at the beginning of chapter 14, he tells the weak, he says, stop putting, putting the, the gavel down and saying, you're wrong, you're wrong. But what he does here is he begins to focus on the strong's responsibility. And it's interesting, you can't see it here in your English language, but there is a play on the word judge in the Greek. It's almost like it says something like this. Therefore, let us cease judging one another, but rather make this simple judgment. <laughs> and he says this, all of you, and he particularly tells the strong, don't any of you put a stumbling block in the path of your brother and sister in Christ. And he's basically saying by insisting that you have the freedom to eat, are you tripping up all of these new are these people who are trying to come in and be a part of God's family. Okay, let's stop for a moment here and let's move from, let's say, 57 AD to 2024. In Lebanon Baptist Church at this moment, we have a variety of different believers here. And many of you are coming to Christ from a variety of different backgrounds. Our unity is in Jesus. We all believe that he died on the cross, he rose again, 
Uh, we want to live for them, and that's, why, that's where we're all at. But some of us see that certain things are permissible, and some of you may think that certain things are not permissible. Now, all of us know there are certain things that are absolutely clear. Thou shalt not commit adultery. This, that. But there are some issues that are gray. There are issues that sometimes, and in this particular situation, observance of certain days. Some of you, you may celebrate every year Passover. Some of you, you don't. Some of you may celebrate Purim. Some of you don't. Some of you, maybe from your religious background, you, you celebrate some of uh, the Catholic holidays. You still do even though you're here. Maybe it's Ash Wednesday or this, and you're just coming. I think that's what we're supposed to do, right? And some of you, when it comes to food, you eat certain things. Some of you say, I'm not sure we should do this, or I'm not sure we should do this activity. There are some of you who would like to celebrate your freedom. Hey, I don't have to do all this stuff. Or I can get, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And what some of us who want to live out our freedom can get into trouble with is some of the other people say, how in the world are they living that particular way? So Paul tells the strong who wanted to, let's say, hey, we can eat whatever we want. He says what you could say Lee Corso sometimes does on uh, college game day, not so fast. Not so fast. He says, don't just celebrate your freedom. Your living out your freedoms can actually be destructive to other people in the church. It's almost like this. You could give your 16-year-old a brand new car and give them all that power and give them all that freedom. But you give them that new car and all that freedom and say, hey, there's no curfew. You You can drive as fast as you want, wherever you want. You know what? Guess what? You can have freedom, but you can also use that freedom to hurt a lot of people and be destructive. And that brings me to point number two, and it's this. The potential danger. Did you notice as we read the text, there were lots of warning signs about danger. We can see, we see the, we can cause, number one, stumbling and a hindrance. That's in verse 13. But the Bible also says that we can destroy, verse 15, destroy, verse 20, and then in stumble in verses 20 and 21, and then people can be condemned in verse 23. Did you know that you and I can destroy another through our actions? And it's interesting that those very terms that Paul uses are terms that he uses elsewhere in talking about final judgment, what we would call eschatological judgment. When I talked about hell. So some of you are asking, are you saying, Pastor Brian, that I could use my freedoms in such a way that I could actually usher somebody into final judgment? Just like I could lead a person to Christ, I could help lead a person away from coming to Christ. I would say there is that potential, yes, At a minimum, you could cause another brother to sin and you can hinder their maturity in Christ and disrupt the unity of the church. That's clear. But even further, you could cause a person to actually leave the faith, which the Bible talks about as apostasy. Apostasizing, you could cause a person to do by insisting that you live out your freedoms the way you want to live it. So let me return us back to that original question, okay, about pizza. Let's just say that a Muslim whose religion doesn't allow pork 
seems to have come to Christ and begins to realize, you know what? This could be, this could be it. And he begins to actually, it seems as if he's turning to Christ. You know, the Bible talks about the seeds and how the sower throws out the seeds and he scatters them. And there are certain times that the seed is sown and it shows signs of what? Life. Hey, look what God's doing here. So let's say that this Muslim starts to come to events, and let's say you find out just through conversations or maybe that he has a problem with pork. And it's just something that just bothers him in his conscience. He may have even tasted it before but felt so guilty about it. He asked himself, does God really allow us to do this? Could that guy, after coming for a while and having you who now kind of know you, hey, yeah, we can do this, could he decide, you know what, I think I'm just going to return to the mosque. Now, it becomes a whole lot more plausible when you take it back to A.D. 57, where there's a Jew, he could decide, you know what, I'm just going to go back to the synagogue and seal his fate and turn away from Jesus Christ. You remember the seed that was thrown into this rocky ground? It sprang up, but the sun scorched it. Now, that's an extreme, yes, but it's plausible. We can cause people to sin and turn. In fact, we can cause them to sin against their own conscience. Now, there are certain things that may not be commanded against, but if we think that something is wrong and we do it, did you know that that is sin? In fact, look what it says in verse 14. He says this, but it is unclean for anyone who thinks it's unclean. Go to verse 23. Okay, look what he says here. He says, but whoever has doubts is condemned if he eats, because the eating is not from faith. For whatever does not proceed from faith is what? Is sin. I like what Mark Dever, who's a pastor in uh, Washington, D.C., said about this. He said this, Conscience cannot make a wrong thing right, but it can make a right thing wrong. And you know the Bible set you up that your conscience, sometimes it's not set perfectly, and all of us need to learn how to set our conscience by the Word of God, but there are times that our consciences are off but we have to be very careful that if our conscience is saying, don't do this, this is not right, you need to obey your conscience in reference to that. You all need to continue to reset it by the word of God, but you are not to sin against your conscience. Andy Maselli, another commentator on the book of Romans, said this, if you do anything you believe is not right, you are sinning. It's our responsibility to guard ourselves from sin, but did you know that all of you, your responsibility as well is to also help everybody else in this assembly guard them and their consciences as well from sinning against the Lord. That's part of your responsibility. Now, a kid can do this. Let me give you an example. Okay, Publix. You know at Publix, let's say some kids run into Publix, and, they, uh, and one of the kids tells his friend, he says, hey, let's go get cookies at the bakery. And there's a jar at the bakery, and many of you know, a lot of Publix says, you know what, if you're a kid, they have a jar, and if you come in, you can get a free cookie. Cookies are free. And there may be one kid who's like, I know that, I get it every time. Some of you adults, I'm still a kid, I can get that free cookie, Okay. But let's say your friend is with you, and they're like, oh, hey, we can get a cookie right here. And they're thinking, I didn't pay for it. And they end up taking the cookie with you. Oh, yeah, it's fine, it's fine. 
Everybody can have it. And they begin to eat of it, but they feel guilty. They feel like, I'm stealing. Which you all know, it's like the strong ones like, hey, ask the manager, okay? Like we would say, ask Jesus. He already said it's good. What about this? What if you're a teenager? And all the kids are going to hang out and it's like a rated R movie. It's like, rated R movie? That's wrong. Maybe in their, and and of course there probably are some things that would not be good, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you. Let I will let no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of them that turn aside. But let's just say all of a sudden one of the kids, they're having a big party and hey, let's watch this. And one of the kids, because of what they've been taught, they're like, they're sinning against their own conscience. And you're helping them to do that. I mean, take it up a few years, maybe it's a Budweiser. Hey, we can, this is fine. Every, come on. Oh, I've never touched any of this stuff. Some of us who have, let's say, are strong in faith, know that he's declared all things clean, and, and there's differences here. We're God's children, remember that, but we're not God's only children. And we've got to make sure we're taking care of everyone, so we need to be cautious. So what does God give us counsel? And that's my third point. So we've seen uh, the issue, we've seen the potential danger, now let's see the counsel. We'll go through these real quick. What does he tell you to do in these situations? First, he tells you, don't ever be a stumbling block in your brother or sister's path. That's what he says in verse 13. He says, therefore, let us not pass judgment on one another, but rather decide never. I love that, never. Never to put a stumbling block or hindrance in the way of your brother. Now, what was the stumbling block? A stumbling block was simply an obstacle. I mean, let's just say you came to church today, and whatever entrance you came in, let's say that I decided before church this week that I was going to put a bunch of landscape stones all through the, 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 the sidewalks as you come in, all through the aisles, all through the hallway. Now, the kids would have loved it. This is awesome. They'd be climbing on the stones, but maybe some of our senior saints was like, what is Pastor Brian thinking? We could trip over these. I'm just turning around and everyone and, uh, and people are falling down everywhere. You'd say, that's not... That's not a good thing. In the same way, you and I need to be very careful that the way we live, we're not putting obstacles on the growth and on the consciences of anybody else within our assembly. We're careful. But then he just doesn't say stumbling blocks, but he also says this, or hindrances. And that word hindrance is an elevated term for a snare. You know, when I was a kid, when I lived back in Greenville, South Carolina, I remember we had all these woods behind our house, and I loved to make forts. And whenever I made forts, I made sure I made defense systems to my forts. And fishing line was always good because I would, I would do tripwire all different places. I would hang sticks way up in the air and tie it so I could cut them off and the sticks would fall on these people's heads. And I would have snares everywhere, Okay. I mean, can you imagine, not only do we have obstacles, but then I also set up snares. And when you're walking in, some guy's hanging upside down at the portico because oh, I got him. <laughs> and maybe there's like, I dig a hole somewhere and like there's a few junior high boys in the hole. And, we, and you're like, what would you do that for? Well, we need to be careful that we don't set up stumbling blocks, obstacles, but also snares to allow other people to fall into sin. For the Gentile Romans, it was their insistence on the public eating of those things. They wanted to eat those things publicly at their gatherings. And in fact, Paul tells the Corinthians, listen to what he tells the Corinthians. He says, but take care that this right of yours. Now, was it okay? Was it a right to eat pepperoni pizza? Yeah. 
But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block for the weak. I'm, I, I am thankful that we probably don't have anybody who, whose conscience is bothered by pepperoni pizza. I'm, I'm saying that because I want you to be cautious. And we all need to be doing this. So number one, don't be a stumbling block. Number two, prioritize love over your freedom. Okay, that's what he says in verse 15. He says this, For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. Now, if you remember, in Romans 13, he told all of us that we have a debt that we owe to everybody else in the family of God, and that's this. we got to love them, and that you and I need to walk in love. And so as we walk in love, what we can do is we can begin to elevate, I have the freedom to do this, and we allow our love for others to come down here. And what we have to do is this, we need to lower our freedoms and enhance our love and our sensitivity to other people. We need to have that as our main concern. In fact, Paul says it a different way in verse 17. He says it this way. For the kingdom of God is not a matter of eating and drinking, but of righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. God's kingdom is not about you just being able to eat and drink what you want to eat and drink. There's greater priorities. You know what one of them is? Righteousness. In fact, this is the last time the word righteousness is found in the book of Romans, which is an amazing. We're going to have to say goodbye to righteousness because that's been an incredible theme. But it's the first time we run into joy. And he says, you need to prioritize righteousness, peace, and joy over what you eat. And if you do this, there's approval. In fact, he says in verse 18, whoever thus serves Christ is acceptable to God and is approved to man, which means this, God is like, thank you for doing this. And then your neighbors are like, hey, I got nothing against this guy. So prioritize love over freedom. Don't for the sake of your hot dog or for your glass of wine destroy another person's life. Okay? Third, here it is. Follow what Jesus did for the weak. What did he do for the weak? Look what it says in verse 15. For if your brother is grieved by what you eat, you are no longer walking in love. By what you eat, do not destroy the one to whom Christ died. Okay, catch this. Okay, if you miss this, we're going to talk a little bit more about it in 15, but I don't think you want to miss it. Okay. In Romans 5, it says this in verse 6 of what Jesus did, and it's the same word for weak that you find in 5 and here in chapter 12. Look what he did for the weak. For while we were still what? Weak. At the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Did you catch that? He was willing to die for the weak. If he was willing to die for the weak, can you give up one of your little freedoms that you like to do when you're showing up here at church? You know what? Maybe so. That's what he did. Number four, pursue peace and edification. That's in verse 19. He says this, so let us pursue what makes for peace and for the mutual upbuilding. How can I try to preserve the peace at this church and build people up in their walk for Jesus Christ? Now, let me illustrate it this way. Sadly, some of you may live out your freedom like one who drives on 285 and never checks his blind spots and thinks he owns the road. Can you imagine this? Can you imagine that you just jumped on 285 and you never looked at any mirrors? You just said, I'm going to do whatever I want because life is a highway. And you crank it up. 
what he's saying is this. What's going to happen to the person who says life is a highway and cranks? They're going to leave destruction all behind them, aren't they? That is why, and I'm so thankful, on cars you have all these mirrors. In fact, on our Honda Pilot you have this. Even if someone's in your blind spot, if you start, you turn on your blinker and you start, you have this little warning light. You know what all of us need to have? We need to have some warning lights as we live out our Christian life because we got other people on the road and it's our church. And these are people whom Christ died for. And you don't want to hinder them. You don't want to cause a wreck in their life. You want to love them and care for them. And you're going to put down your own freedoms because you love them. Finally, he tells you this. Keep faith between you and God. Look what he says in verse 22. The faith that you have, keep between yourself and God. Now, what does he mean by that? He's basically telling you this. You make sure that you're keeping very close tabs on your relationship to the Lord. It could be this. God, I know I can have this cup of wine. I know that, I mean, there is a point where you created this such and such. I know I can do this. Okay, God, you and I are in agreement about this. But whatever, you need to preserve your integrity of your walk with the Lord and make sure you're right with him. But this is what he's saying, and I like how Andy Nacelli said it, this commentator, he said, maintain your convictions about disputable matters. It may mean, I know I can do this. This is a freedom that I have. But you don't need to broadcast these convictions and flaunt them. There's a point where some of those freedoms that you have, they may be freedoms that you're going to have to enjoy in private. For the good of other people and the good of God's people. And there's a blessing in this. Look what he says in verse 22 at the end of it. He said, blessed is the one who has no reason to pass judgment on himself for what he approves. He's not, there's, you're not judging yourself because you've just... You'd feel pretty bad if you realized that you caused about five or six wrecks. Blessed are you when you know that there's nothing that you've tried to live blamelessly. He keeps his own conscience clear of hurting other people. N.T. Wright said it this way, Christians grow in maturity at different rates. And during this process, I cannot and must not hurry or harry them to accept positions their consciences at the moment cannot allow. Lebanon Baptist Church, I close with this. This is a response to grace. If you've embraced Jesus Christ as your Savior, He's told you now to care for the flock that you live in. And how do you do that? Well, you beware and don't prioritize your freedom in Christ over your love for others. God's family and the unity within his body should be your priority in life. And I'll tell you this, I want our church to be one of the safest highways in your growth to Jesus Christ. That we as a church, we keep the aisles clear, we keep the parking lot safe, that we're all growing in grace and in the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Why? Because we are prioritizing our love for each other, but we also have an incredible freedom in Christ. May God help all of us on our journey to heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your instruction this morning. Would you help us as a church now to be those who live out these instructions in our spiritual life. We love you. We thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for this family. Lead us home to heaven safely. In Jesus' name, amen. Right before we dismiss, I do have a, a great privilege of bringing some new members into our church. And so Bill and Krista, come on up. Many of you know Bill and Krista because they sit up front, okay? And... Uh, and Hey, what's that guy's name who sits up in the front? Oh, that's Bill. And, uh, and so this is Bill and Krista. They've been coming for a while, and they are ready to unite with our church family.
And uh, I'm excited. Of course, to become a member of our church, it's not, you just don't decide to do that. You decide to follow Christ. He opens your eyes to it, and, and there's a supernatural event that happens. And that happened in both Bill and Krista's life. In reference to Bill, he said this about Jesus. Jesus is God, the Son of God. The Word made flesh. He is my merciful Savior who reached into darkness and rescued me from sin and shame and made me His child. He knows that if He was to die, He would be present with Jesus in heaven today, awaiting the bodily resurrection from the dead. I would be present with Jesus because He's rescued me from my sins. He's credited in me with His righteousness, and He's washed me clean. I'm a child cleansed by the blood of Christ. It was as a two-year-old that he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes. And that had marked his life and always kind of made him feel different. He asked as a child how he was supposed to contend with this suffering and pain. He says, I was painfully aware of being on the outside and being different. I hated myself and was filled with sorrow for what I lost that everybody else seemed to have. He said it was in sixth grade. He said he was at a youth retreat that he... Uh, he was at a youth retreat, and he made a decision for Jesus Christ, and he was later baptized in the following months. It was going into his ninth grade year, he struggled again in reference to this and just even questioned life. And it was going back to another retreat. He shares how somebody at that retreat showed unconditional love to him. It was another person. And God used that to broadcast his love in Bill's life. And he says, my life was forever changed. The girl who I knew, uh, who was a few years older than me, took me under her wing, introduced me to people, and made me feel secure. I mean, made me feel loved. And she, he said, why is she being so kind? He says, I was suddenly able to see God and his love for me. How he had nothing to offer God and didn't deserve his love, but he poured it out on me anyway. I am a sinner, nothing good on my own, but he still pours his love, mercy, and grace on me. What a testimony. And then Krista, when we asked her about Jesus Christ, she says, he is the Christ, the son of the living God. He has rescued me from my sin, washed me clean, and placed his righteousness on me so I can live in his holy presence. She knows that if she was to die, she'd be absent from the body. She'd be present with the Lord. I believe that I will be with Jesus when I die, and it's because of his sacrifice in his righteousness, he places on me that I have an opportunity to stand before the Father and not perish. I'm so thankful for his mercy. She came to know the Lord at four years old. She publicly professed her faith through baptism when she was 14. She even uh, teared up even this morning as she was sharing again her testimony. She even talks about how at times she was lost in the word of faith prosperity gospel movement. I am so thankful that God opened my eyes to who he truly is and how to study the Scripture the right way, and not just cherry-pick a piece of Scripture and use it like a fortune cookie message and, uh, and how God saved her. And so Bill and Krista want to join our assembly today, so I'd like to recommend them for membership. Do I have a second? All right, Jeff Griffin. All in favor of bringing them into our membership. If you're a member, say yes. 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 If anybody would be opposed to that, say yes as a member. Okay, no. <laughs> yeah. I did tell how one time there was a guy who was hard of hearing who was sitting up at the front. It was when the leaves were joining. And he, he said, yes, right at that point. Uh, uh, I'm not sure if I have to do that, but we've always done it. Okay, so anyway, uh, we are si excited about having you as part of our family and look forward to seeing how God's going to use you in the days ahead. Well, after the service, if you haven't met Bill and Christy, you're welcome to come up here. You know where they sit, okay, so you can always meet them up here. Let me close our service with prayer. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for all that you have done for us this week as we celebrate what our nation has called us to do in reference to Thanksgiving. Lord, may we as believers in many ways abound in Thanksgiving, not just this week, but through our entire life. Bless us this day. Bring us back safely. If you do not come back this week, bring us back safely as we continue to worship you. We pray this and all the people of the Lord said, amen. Have a good week.